And I will be uh, making some forward-looking statements today as part of my talk. So first, I wanted to describe a little bit Sigalon's platform technology, which we call Shielded Living Therapeutics. And fundamentally, we're harnessing the power of the human cell with a goal of delivering functional cures to patients for a broad range of chronic diseases. And for many years, there's been a lot of elegant work on cell therapy, and particularly allogeneic cell therapies. But there have been a couple of issues that have led to a lack of persistence of the therapy, therapy for the cells. The first issue is that with an allogeneic cell, cell-cell contact with the immune system leads to clearance of the cells, and therefore a lack of persistent therapeutic, therapeutic efficacy for the cells. The second aspect is that when people try to get around this cell-cell contact by encasing the cells in a device, that device, when implanted in the body, leads to a foreign body response. And that foreign body response will cause fibrosis of the device, locking off nutrients for the cells, again leading to cell death and a lack of persistence. So Sigalon's technology is leveraging the core work of our founders, Bob Langer and Dan Anderson from MIT, and work that they did to find a small molecule that can help shield the cells from this antifibrotic or this fibrotic response. So on the left of the panel, you see our shielded cells in a sphere that's a dual layer sphere. In the inner compartment, we have gene modified human cells that are in an environment designed for maximal cell growth and persistence. And then they're shielded in an outer layer of what we call a fibromer, which is our technology that prevents that foreign body response. On the right, you can see a sphere outlined in red, which shows macrophage binding. Um, and this has the first stage of fibrosis and fibrosis the spheres. Um, to the right, you see in that little white dashed line where the sphere is that uses the afibromer technology. And in this sphere, you don't get that macrophage binding, and you also don't see fibrosis. So the potential attributes of our shielding level shielded living therapeutics is really based on the fact that we're a non-viral engineered cell-based therapy. So it's designed for the cells to be within the sphere, um, expressing the therapeutic protein of interest, um, and has some benefits of, for example, not altering the host genome. So we don't have any interaction between the cells and the patient. It's also designed to be durable with no immune suppression, and we have the ability to redose and retrieve our spheres. We also have controllable exposure by, um, based on the volume of spheres that you're treating a patient with. And we put a lot of work into our manufacturing strategy so it will be affordable and off the shelf. So there are two necessary components of our platform. We have the cell, and then we have our biomaterials. So our cells, for the bulk of our indications, are based on a same parental cell line, which was chosen for a variety of characteristics. So we've chosen a cell line that has a history of safety and clinical use. It persists well in the spheres so that we have a durable cell. It is very easy um, to manufacture and scale, and it's a plug-and-play system. So we have the same allogeneic, well-characterized cell line, which when we then, just for a different indication, genetically modify with a different gene cassette. The second component is our biomaterials that make up the sphere. And so we have a alginate that's the inner alginate that is modified with a peptide to set up a good environment for the cells to lay down in the matrix and to persist happily within the sphere. And then, as I mentioned, we have our outer layer of a fibromer, which is an alginate modified with a small molecule to protect against the foreign body effect. We control our spheres with regards to the size and the porosity so that nutrients can passively diffuse into the sphere and feed the cells, and the therapeutic protein of interest can diffuse out to have the therapeutic effect. The alginates that we use, those biomaterials, are exactly the same for every indication. So we have a very standardized GMP manufacturing process, and in fact have filed a drug master file to make the regulatory filing process easier for that component as well. We bring together the cells and the, and the biomaterials to manufacture our spheres. So the cells, as a well-characterized allogeneic cell line, we develop a master and a working cell bank process, um, and then start with a cell expansion, develop the cells, combine them with the biomaterials, and have spent a lot of time and effort developing a semi-automated manufacturing system, which is also scalable, flexible, and the same for each indication. So we leverage that manufacturing knowledge and the manufacturing process across our platform. 
And finally, we place the spheres through a short laparoscopic procedure into the IP cavity of a patient. So this shows our pipeline, where we have focus areas first in rare, in rare bleeding disorders, with our first clinical indication being against hemophilia A. We also have a pipeline in lysosomal storage diseases, where our consistent expression is beneficial not only in the expression of the enzyme replacement, but also the tissue penetration, where when you don't have a replacement um, peak and trough of the therapy, that constitutive expression, and I'll show you some data a little bit later, gives you a better penetration into tissues. And then we have our endocrine um, and other disorders where we have a partnership in diabetes with Lilly, and we're also moving into the immune-mediated disease space. So this is um, some information about our SIGA-01 hemophilia A trial and its phase one, two dose escalation study. So we kicked this off last year and we have treated three patients in the UK and in the US. Uh, we are currently on a clinical hold due to a low level inhibitor that developed in the third patient. Uh, we are currently investigating any com potential contributing factors to that inhibitor development and are moving towards lifting that clinical hold. Uh, we have validated the GMP manufacturing and logistics of the delivery. I'll show you in a few slides that the drug product for SIGO-01 is a fresh drug product. Um, and so there is some logistics involved in delivering, and we were successful in doing that for our first three patients dosed. And we've also observed measurable plasma factor eight levels. You can see in the picture in the inset, um, the delivery in the momentum of the spheres, and you can see those small jelly-like um, little circles are our SIGO-01 spheres laying down on the momentum of the patient. Next, I'm gonna switch gears a little and talk about our lysosomal storage diseases. So our modular platform is designed to be able to rapidly develop and be applied to a range of lysosomal storage diseases, um, leading to that significant improvements that I mentioned with regards particularly to tissue penetration. Uh, we have preclinical studies across a variety of these diseases, and we've recently received orphan drug designation for SIGO-05 for MPS1 and SIGO-07 for Fabray. So I wanted to show you a little bit of our preclinical data, particularly supporting that tissue penetration for hard-to-reach tissues for MPS1. So these are some data in particular looking at one of the harder tissues to reach, which is bone. And in an MPS1 uh, mouse model, you can see that normally in the disease state, you have a thickening of the cortical area of the bone. And you can see that in the middle panel um, as a visualization on the top, where you have some thick um, cortical sections. And then in the treated MPS1 mice, you can see a normal or thinner cortical thickness. And that data is shown in the leftmost panel, where you have in the um, black squares the untreated animals, and the blue circles, the treated, and you can see that statistically significant decrease in cortical thickness. At the same time, on the most right-hand panel, you can see the sustained reduction in the gag substrate um, over five months in the bone for the SIGA-05 on the left versus the untreated. So we were very excited to see this kind of um, penetration into the bone in the mouse model data. One of the other things that we've been working on quite a lot and seeing already implemented in our MPS2 or, SIGO, or MPS1 or SIGO01 program or SIGO05 program is that we have been working on cryopreserving our drug substance. Um, in the top graph here, you can see the manufacturing process for our hemophilia A SIGO01 program, which is a fully fresh process. So we expand our cells for roughly four weeks um, and then we harvest them and immediately um, formulate our drug substance and go into encapsulation to make the drug product before we fill and off to the patient. So this is a roughly five week process to manufacture the drug product. And so it requires quite a bit of coordination between our manufacturing and logistics team and our clinical operations team. As I mentioned earlier, we have successfully done this with our three treated patients, but it does take quite a lot of time and effort. So from the beginning, we were planning a stepwise improvement of our manufacturing process. The first step, which is cryopreservation of our drug substance. So you can see now for MPS1, on the lower left-hand panel, we do that same cell expansion for roughly four weeks, but now when we harvest, we cryopreserve. And this means we can do our manufacturing at any time and build up a clinical supply of drug substance. Now in approximately a one-week process, when we're ready to treat a patient, we pull um, our cryopreserved drug substance, thaw it, encapsulate, and it's still a fresh drug product at this point that goes to the patient for treatment. 
One of the critical things that we needed to do in implementing this cryopreservation was to demonstrate comparability between the two. So the inset on the right shows you um, sham treated, again, MPS1 mouse model mice, where you have a very high level of heparin sulfate in the liver um, with fresh drug substance um, made encapsulated into drug product or cryopreserved drug substance encapsulated into drug product. We have equivalent reduction um, of that substrate level. So non-statistically significant difference between the two. So this was um, important data that led to going into our SIG-005 phase one, two safety and dosing clinical design. So you can see the design here um, and just some important status updates. We did receive CTA approval um, in the UK from the MHRA to proceed with this program. We have filed the CTA in Brazil and we are planning on filing our IND very soon. I wanna briefly mention um, the Sigalon and Lilly collaboration on a potential functional cure for type 1 diabetes. This is the one program where we are not using um, our common cell line, but are instead using iPSCs differentiated into islets. And this program kicked off in April of 2018, um, and we're making progress along that program with some substantial uh, financial commitment from Lilly. Just to show you some early preclinical data, not using our iPSC-derived islets, but rather um, in the left-hand panel, rat donor islets, and in the right-hand panel, um, encapsulated human cadaveric islets. In both cases, using the Sigalon spheres, you can see the um, glucose control that we saw in STZ mice over a very long period of time. So we're making progress in this program with a goal of having insulin independence in the absence of immunosuppression. So just for my final slide, um, as I mentioned, manufacturing optimization is very important for us, and we have a goal of getting to an off-the-shelf, a fully off-the-shelf product with a favorable cost of goods. So we have three pillars in our manufacturing optimization. Um, the first one is around expansion into 3D cell culture at a large scale for a cellular drug substance. This is enabled already by our cryopreserved um, drug substance work that I showed you in MPS1. And now you can scale this up to the 200 liter or beyond so that you have very um, large batch sizes with favorable economics. Our middle, middle pillar is around automated encapsulation. So we currently run our manufacturing with a semi-automated system. We're developing a system that will be fully automatic, um, closed and aseptic, and capable of doing large volume batches of our drug product. And that will be coupled with our final pillar, which is around cryopreserved drug product, which would enable you to do large scale production of our drug product spheres and then cryopreserve them for a true off-the-shelf therapeutic. So all of these together are meant to make our product not only effective, but also accessible. So thank you very much for your time. Um,